Large language models are good zero-shot learners. How about smaller models? Uh, the size of language models really, really matter. Really, is the most important factors for its zero-shot learning capability. This is what we're going to talk about today. There are two questions that's actually very, very essential for this paper. Can zero-shot generalization instead be directly induced by implicit multitask learning? Uh, this means most of large language models, they have zero-shot capability. It's because they learn those multitasks. They learn those task knowledge during language model pre-training, mask language modeling, implicitly. But what if we explicitly introduce those uh, tasks to the model? Will they be much better? Will it be more efficient? If it's more efficient, means that you can use a smaller model to achieve the same or even better uh, learning capability. So this paper is super interesting. It's published very recently, Multitask prompt, Prompted Training and it en enables the zero-shot task generalization. And it's a paper mainly from Hugging Face and the Brown University. Of, co of course, this is a uh, 41-author paper. It's uh, very, very rare to see the paper has so many authors. Uh, but I definitely understand it's a kind of big project. You need to run on so many different tasks. So good to see this one. And the answer for these two questions is yes and yes. Um, if you implicitly introduce a ta multitask uh, learning training process, your model can actually uh, learn this kind of capability, the transfer generalization of a task. This means if you learn this task, maybe you learn, learn NER, then you can perform very well in, in the future for entity sentiment analysis. So it often outperforms the, the model up to 16 times of its size. So it's amazing. That's truly amazing. That means it's much, you can say it's 16 times more data efficient. So how, how do they introduce multitask learning in the training process explicitly? It's they frame every different tasks to a sequence to sequence problem. This is very similar to T5. Just any kind of language, um, natural language problems can be framed as sequence to sequence problems. Uh, for example, summarization is very straightforward. It's originally, like most people do it as a sequence to sequence problem, right? You give the model a, a, summer, a kind of source text, and the model gives you a summary. But a little different thing is, model, in this case, model doesn't have prior knowledge that, like the prior knowledge that, oh, you need to do summarization. If I give you an input, you summarize it. Model doesn't know that at all. So how 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 do we communicate with model is we need to put some natural language here. For example, you put a, a source text here, then you ask a small question, how would you rephrase that in a few words? The model will rephrase that for you, which is summarize. Another task, another example, paraphrase uh, identification. The, the nature of this, this task is we will give a model two sentences. The model need to classify if it's a duplication or not. Then traditional is just a train a classifier, but in, in this case, model doesn't know anything about this task at all. So you need to tell model uh, something. You need to ask model uh, these questions are are th these questions duplicate or not. The model will know. And uh, how model know is model also have some common sense, some basic knowledge of language of English. The model will understand these questions a little bit. The model will tell you, oh, it's not duplicate, and that. It's the way to frame any task to sequence to sequence, or you can say it's prompting. And uh, another is, uh, question answering, which is uh, traditionally we treat it as a like sequence, uh, and it's like span extraction. We extract the, the answer from a given text. It's more like you just uh, classify tokens. If this token is supposed to be an answer, then in this case, you just give the model a very long uh, article here. Then uh, in the last of the uh, Last part of the prompt, you ask the model one question. Can you tell me what it is? So how how do model know? Is because you already ask the model one questions here. This question is definitely dynamic, depending on the, your question and article pair. And uh, you also insert articles here. So you ask the model questions here and put articles here and ask last one. This is more like instruction. The model will know, will give you an answer. So this is how it work. And for natural language inference. Also the same thing, you give model 
uh, something the model needs to infer certain things. For example, in this case, you give model a statement, and you ask model, can we infer uh, certain things? The model will tell you, oh, yes or no. So it's very, very natural, just like if you want to ask humans to do these different tasks, you will also give the description like this. Instead of just training human brain and give it a one high encoder labels and train them to the paper up, we don't do that for humans. So if we want to build a very, very intelligent machines, we also want to want it to be kind of inspired by humans. And this is the way how we kind of, uh, and this is maybe a good way to build a more intelligent machine. So before we dive in, if you would like to receive more deep learning related video like this, don't forget to subscribe. Your subscription really means a lot for me core principle of this paper is they want to see if model can do certain tasks if they never seen before during training time so they to verify that they will need to have some subset of task for training and some subset of task for evaluation and the task that's for evaluation they cannot be seen during the training time so they need to separate that it's like uh, you have training tasks test task and uh, the final one problem is NLP task classification is fuzzy. It's fuzzy, right? So you basically uh, very hard to definitively separate those kind of different tasks. And it's not perfect, but let's still do that. And they organize a task based on a task format as a supposed to require skills. Here are the tasks they classify. There are 12 different tasks and uh, over 60 different data sets. So you can see there are many different tasks. So this is like 12 main NLP tasks that people are usually working on. So they separate them, uh, they separate it, and how they choose what should be a training task and what should be a test task. So they separate certain, certain tasks to uh, training, some to test. So we just see one of the test task. The test task is a senten sentence completion, natural language inference, co-reference, co resolution and the word sense disambiguation and also uh, Google B bench and the rest of the tasks are for uh, training. So during a training time, they will convert this to prompt languages and uh, the answer, then the model will just learn from these things. And during the inference time, evaluation time, model will need to uh, do sentence completion and uh, natural language inference and so on. One thing that's very important is you need really need to know during a training time model doesn't do anything about natural language inference, co-reference, resolution, word sensitive disambiguation. Model doesn't do anything about that. Model doesn't have any prior knowledge of that. So that's why they want to test. Is, can model really generalize this? If we convert this to prompts, can model really predict that correctly? That's what they want to do. So this is just, uh, uh, there are some criteria as they see in these four different tasks they, they, they use for tests. It's because most humans are also not trained to do these tasks. But um, I also will argue for this uh, training task, most humans are also not trained. Maybe uh, the QA one, yeah, humans are trained, but a lot of like other things, uh, paraphrase identification, topic classification, sentiment, humans are now uh, ex explicitly trained as well. And for these four tasks, Human are not explicitly trained, but we do that all the time, implicitly. Uh, co-reference resolution, we definitely do a lot of co-referencing uh, to understand what these pronouns means, right? And also word sensitive disambiguation, we definitely do a lot because I, when I say apple, it could be apple or fruit, the fruit, it could be the company. So you definitely do that in your mind, but you just don't do that. This is just a some more uh, visual for how they prompt the, the, the things. So paraphrase, Basically, there are two questions, and uh, you want to know are these two questions the uh, same one or not the same one. So how they convert that to a prompt, they usually have multiple templates for one task. For this task, they have uh, this template, question one, question two, pick one. This we already, we already seen previously. And this is another one. I received a questions, uh, question one and the question two. Are they duplicates? Okay, so that's just a better. They want to give the model different templates so the model have, may have better generalization capability. For summarization, same thing. You give the documents and would you rephrase this in a few words or uh, first please read the article and then now you can you write me the extreme 
this short abstract for it. So there are also just the uh, multiple templates for summarization, and this is very natural. The just like if you want to ask humans to do something, you will use this one, right? If you would do a summarization test for students, students, you will also write descriptions for the task, and this is how we communicate with the model. So this is much better way I would really argue. Uh, previously, we just don't tell model any, any, anything. We just say, oh, you need to learn from training data. But by doing that, if you train a summarizer, the, it can only do summarization. It cannot do any other task. But it, by doing this kind of a natural prompting, model can do what model can learn just one task and do other tasks as well. So it's more become more like humans. So personally, I think the future of NLP uh, will be very different from now. It is for NLP engineering. Uh, because previously NLP um, mostly focused on training a model, right? It's like designing a model, classification model, token classification model. But since GPT-3 or like larger language models that are coming up, they really have like little sharp learning capability. So we can really just design a lot of prompts and get a very good result without any training or even just with a little bit training with prompts. So it's more, it's become more like a prompt from model design to prompt design. If you can design a good prompt, then your model will perform well. You, your model will perform well, just like what you see previously. So how to design a good prompt? They require certain knowledge of how the model works and how the languages work. So that's just my personal opinion for certain part of the natural language processing. They'll become like this, but definitely not all. There are a lot of different areas that still need a lot of uh, model building to, to solve the problems. So the model they use in this paper is uh, is T5, but it's not really just a T5. It's a language model T5. It's a the T5, and they, they kind of uh, find you on language modeling task. And it has 11 billion parameters. And how and it's, it's, it's for how they do the prompting, they just fine tune a pre-trained model, fine tune a pre-trained T5. Uh, more specifically, it's LM T5. Even 11 billion parameters. You would say it's a big model, but compared to GPT-3, uh, it's uh, not that big. Okay, so this is uh, their held out task task. So we can just see the first uh, first row. You can see uh, it's very amazing. It's very amazing. Uh, let's just see some color. What co these colors mean? Uh, for blue colors, uh, they mean GPT-3, and from GPT-6 billion uh, parameters to 13 and the largest the GPT-3, which is 175 billion. It's around 16 times of this model, uh, the model they use. So T5 plus LM is basically a T5 model without prompt, prompted training. And this T0 is their model, which is trained with those, prompt, with those prompts. So uh, you can see for this natural language inference model, you, we just uh, compare the plain T5 LM and the T, T0 which is their model. The performance just increased so much. So this is a huge jump, huge jump. Bear in mind, they have the same number of parameters. They just kind of fine tune in this prompted task. And the, the model T0 also never seen natural language inference task before, but it still can generate so much better than the one without prompted training. So this is amazing. And also compared to the larger, much larger model, which is GPT-3 large. You can see that its performance just uh, much better than GPT-3 large. So that just tells us one thing. Prompted training is extremely powerful. So we can also see the same thing happen in the co-reference. Co-reference, for co-referencing, uh, the performance jump is not that big, but still significant, but still significant. It's still uh, much better than the untrained T5. And also, uh, Kind of uh, still not as good as GPT-3, but it's at least closing the gap. And for other sentence completions, which is like story completion, it's originally quite weak. Uh, on trend it was quite weak, and immediately, uh, original the performance was like a fifty something, and uh, now it's close to ninety. It's ninety something. So. You can see how effective it is, and in some t subtask of story com completion, it's even better than GPT-3 and by quite a large margin. But definitely, it's not all the tasks uh, for some data, data sets that help help us whack. It's still not comparable to GPT-3. But, but interestingly, for the world sense disaggregation, 
uh, which is uh, to find out uh, what the meaning of this word is. Uh, just like what I say, uh, apple can have multiple meanings, and you need to figure out which one it is. It's a fruit or it's an apple computer. Okay, so this task, surprisingly, is so much better than GPT-3. GPT-3 almost cannot do anything. But uh, the even on 25 can do 50% uh, accuracy, much better than GPT-3, which is worse than random. It's like random. But if you train the, do the prompted training, it's much better. It becomes much better. Okay, so this is the end of the video. Amazing papers, truly amazing. I think that provided me a lot of, uh, provided us a lot of information about how we go about it. And more importantly, they release their call and the prompted data sets and those trend models. So if you are already working on certain tasks, you may try their things, right? That will be super interesting, super interesting. They didn't say how to do NER, Namitis, recommendation or some other things. But it's easy to you can very easy to convert task this uh, ta different tasks to prompty language. So that's the end of the video. If you would like to receive more deep learning videos like this, definitely subscribe. And if you find this video helpful, uh, don't forget to like, share the videos. They really help the YouTube algorithms. Other than that, I'll see you next time.